So a very good evening to one and all present here. Uh, first of all, uh, let us welcome the today's speaker, Mr. Vince Stevenson from uh, UK. He is very well known as the fear doctor, speaker, trainer, author, and whatnot. So I welcome you all to this virtual meeting and uh, so it's indeed pleasure to welcome Mr. Vince Stevenson, the speaker of today's virtual meeting. Before we start the meeting, I welcome all the participants also to join this virtual meeting and take part in this uh, fear of public speaking where the Mr. Stevenson will be talking more about what the things to be taken care, especially when we deal with the public speaking. I would like to introduce about Mr. Vince. Vince is a well-known speaker, trainer, and has won several awards of leadership, education, and development. He is a founder of the College of Public Speaking London and works as an education director managing all aspects of course del delivery and content. Vince is also one of the UK's leading speech coaches. He has worked with leaders across the spectrum of politics, industry, finance, as well as featuring primarily in humanita humanitarian role. Vince is an avid learner and in recent years has accomplished many certificates in learning and communication science with University of California, San Diego, the University of Amsterdam and instructional design with the Institute of Adult Learning Singapore. Vince is also a qualified teacher trainer and over the last 15 years, his enthusiastic membership of, membership of several voluntary organization has helped to raise the awareness and standards of effective communication. He is the trusted advisor behind the college's outstanding pro bono service to the third sector. If I keep on reading his contribution to the whole world, it will not be enough even a day to speak about Mr. Vince. I have been fortunate enough to meet Mr. Vince during my fellowship at University of East London, where he educated me and uh, many more participants about public speaking. And I consider him as my, him, him as my teacher, my guru. So welcome you to this uh, virtual meeting, sir. We all welcome you and we all are eagerly waiting to listen to you, sir. Today with us, we have another uh, um, uh, means uh, friend, Dr. Siram Pandey. He is also with us. He has joined the program and other participants are also watching this program. So may I request Mr. Vince to please address the virtual gathering. Over to you, sir. Okay, DP, thank you so much. That was, um, that was an amazing introduction. Thank you so much. I couldn't have written that better myself. Uh, it's rather embarrassing hearing about uh, yourself and all of the, the things that you've done over the years, but uh, I'm probably three times as old as most of the people on the call. So I guess I've done a lot with, uh, with my time, my professional life. So it's great to be here. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done a live webinar, speaking to so many people in India, and uh, I'm rather excited. So let's get straight into talking about the fear of public speaking, because it's a huge issue. It's something that all young men and young women go through in their ascendancy, in their careers. It's a really wonderful skill to get on top on, of. And, and to enjoy, I think the most important thing is that you enjoy your speaking, that you enjoy your communication. And I think the great thing about being a teacher is that you share your knowledge and your passion uh, with other people. So a lot of people feel, uh, who, who am I? 
why should people listen to me and uh, who, who on earth am I and, and, and we have a quite a negative self-perception uh, which really doesn't help because I think the, the great thing about human beings is that we all have a story We're all, we all come from a family we come from somewhere things have happened to us uh, who've, who've got us to where we are whatever whatever situation you find yourself in and as human beings one of the, I think one of the great things and I'm sure DP will agree with me that for example when he did his fellowship work he was working very closely with lots of people from around the world from different backgrounds different uh, technological disciplines and what happens is when people come together to share that knowledge and that experience something wonderful occurs and then you can take back that knowledge you can take back all the things that you've learned from other people and then you can share it with your colleagues and uh, that's the wonderful thing about uh, I think it's one of the wonderful things about those fellowships uh, for example but it's also a great thing that today uh, under the circumstances of uh, you know COVID-19 uh, we're, we're all on this call together and that we can talk together and uh, we, we can share something hopefully you, that you're going to find incredibly value valuable and that you can utilize from straight afterwards so because we've only got an hour or so um, I'm, I, there's no way I can talk about all the things that I think are really really beneficial so I'm going to I'm going to go to what I believe to be the main thing so DP if you could put the speech considerations you could share that word file please okay sure, sure. okay so I think what uh, generally freaks most people out about public speaking is the thought that they are not going to be prepared and that maybe they don't really know how or what to practice and what to prepare. So what I propose to do in part of today's session is to go through these, what I describe as speech considerations. And uh, we're gonna be sharing these documents and so we'll share this document with you after the speech. So if you wanna make notes, that's great, but you, your uh, DP will make this available for download afterwards and you, you can have this document. So the first one that says, number one, uh, the date of the speech. So let's say, here's a scenario. You've got to make a speech in three weeks time. Okay, so three weeks time. Let's say, let's say you, the 15th of June, for example. Let's say you've got to make a speech on the 15th of June. And you've been told that this is going to be a 15 minute speech. So that's number two there. So the duration of the speech. So the date of the speech, the duration of the speech. This, this is already useful. What is the title of the speech going to be? So what's the general theme of your speech? And where is the event where you're going to present your speech? Okay, so where is that going to happen? So think about the think about the classroom. It may be in a classroom. It may be in a conference center. You might be speaking in a hotel. It might be some event somewhere. It's really important that you can visualize where it is that you're going to be. So, because that helps you with your preparation. When, you, when you've got your mind around these things, it's really, really good to know. Then, then you, you don't find uh, when you get there that you've uh, forgot to do some very important preparation. So the next thing you need to think of uh, these days is, you know, if you are speaking at a hotel or a conference venue, uh, is there going to be a microphone there? Generally, there will be at a hotel or a conference event. Will there be a podium? Uh, will you be in one of those, uh, it looks like a, a little box on the stage. Are you going to be standing behind one of those or will it be a lectern? Will you need to use something like PowerPoint? Again, so you might, you might need to prepare that in advance. You might need to ensure that the people who are running the event receive those PowerPoint details in advance. And of course, you'll need to know, is, will there be projection? So again, if you're working at a hotel or a conference center, generally, that's what you'll find. However, if you're making this speech at your own venue, in your own classroom, uh, depending on the size of the audience, will you need to make sure that those facilities are available? So question number two there, it says, uh, what's the context of the speech? Uh, what is the intended outcome? So this is really important, of course, because every speech, you're, as we mentioned, we're, we're there to disseminate information. We want to share the best of our knowledge and our experience with people. So 
really think through that. What is the intended outcome? What would be the best outcome for you? And what would be the best outcome for your audience? What do you want them to go away to think about or maybe to act upon? So sometimes we're just sharing information that's useful. Sometimes we want people to go away and to do action. So I think uh, we're all familiar with this uh, lockdown situation. And uh, I'm sure you'll have seen lots of presentations by politicians in recent times explaining what the new rules are, what we need to do, and you know what action that we need to take when we leave that, uh, that presentation, either through the news media or, or the radio, or however uh, the message has been disseminated. What would be the intended outcome? So think about that. Now, what is your relationship to the subject matter? Well, um, for example, yesterday we, uh, we, we saw uh, there was a big presentation by the, the Prime Minister. So if you're the Prime Minister and you're managing a pandemic, that's your relationship. That's who you are. But of course, generally in these presentations, they have some doctors or people, you know, scientists with them who are going to help share the message, you know, and go into the te technical detail of the hows and whys of how to manage uh, pandemics, for example. So what is your relationship to the subject matter? I think, I think generally it's important that people know who you are, where you're from, what your background is. And then, then when you speak uh, and you share that information, uh, people will know your background and where you're coming from. And that's why uh, generally at the outset on these, these calls, somebody like DP gives a very nice introduction to the guest speaker so that everybody knows who I am, what my background is, and, and what my interest is. So this all rather makes sense. So what's your relationship to the subject matter? And of course, would that have an impact on the tone of your speech? So people, there might be lots of uh, very in interested people who've got lots to say, uh, but generally most people have a vested interest or a direction that they're coming from, an angle, let's say, where they're coming from, which would have some, some form of impact on the speech there. So who is the audience? Who are you going to be talking to? Now, this is really, really important because uh, when, I, when I was a young man, I used to work in IT and I used to make a lot of presentations. And when I was talking to my IT colleagues, because we all came from a background and we all had similar frames of reference and we all knew the difficulties and uh, how tricky some things were, uh, sometimes things don't always work out the way you want them to and everybody generally understands. But if you're making the same speech to a slightly different audience, for example, different stakeholders, uh, if you're talking to business owners and... Uh, and Sir, your voice uh, is little low. Thinking, it's uh, not clear. Uh, been an outage of uh, the IT systems and things like that, or there's been a, a loss of revenue because of that outage. Those guys, they're not, they're really not that interested in technical problems. What they're interested in is the solutions and how can they get things back up online and, uh, and getting those revenue streams. So they're not interested in technical problems. They just want to know when is it going to be fixed and how do we prevent that from happening again. So again, the audience are really, really interested, uh, but everybody comes from a slightly different angle and a different viewpoint. So if you know that uh, there's a nuance in that audience, try and find out what their interests and attitudes are so that you can then cover those. So could you just scroll down a little bit, please, DP? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So... We get to uh, number six there. So does the speech have one recurring message? So that may be the case. Political speeches generally have one recurring message. Uh, so we, we've, we, we've seen in the UK during the, uh, the lockdown here, uh, save lives, stay at home. And, and every day, and even, even on the, the lectern, or the podium that people are speaking from, we see the message written so that everybody really gets the message. So we had a general election in December last year and the government 
uh, had a very simple message. Let's get it done. Let's get Brexit done. It was a Brexit election. Let's get it done. Because for three and a half years, we spent uh, arguing uh, even after the referendum result. And uh, because we had a locked parliament, we weren't making a great deal of progress. So does it have a recurring message? Because that's good. That really helps people with the takeaway. OK, can you scroll down again, please, DP? OK, so number seven there, it says, what's the purpose of the speech? And this is really important because uh, I think that when you're preparing your speech, having this really clear in your head helps a huge amount because there's so many different things that you can do in a speech. So, for example, you can inform, you can educate, uh, you can persuade, motivate, inspire, entertain. These are all really good reasons for making speeches. Now, what, what is the purpose of your speech? Now, most speeches at work, for example, I would say, certainly in my IT career, were to uh, inform. Uh, occasionally, there would be some educational material. Sometimes there would be some training material as well. So if you can work out in advance, what type of speech is it going to be? And then focus on the purpose. Uh, if you try and tick the boxes there of information, education, persuasion, and inspiration, for example, you might be jumping around um, and making it very, very difficult for the audience to follow the major things. So if you could stick with one theme, that's a really, really useful thing for you. And it's very useful for the audience. Occasionally, you might have to just touch on two or three of them. But either way, the less is more. Less is more in this case. So just really think through the purpose of your speech. What do you want people to, to do when that speech ends? So there we are. Now, is the speech values driven? And if so, what are the values? Now, as I said, there's, there's lots of different reasons for making speeches. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, now, in England, there's a big thing at weddings. Now, I don't, I'm not familiar with Indian weddings. DP, you could answer this one for me. Um, at an Indian wedding, do, uh, do people make speeches? Pardon? I, I didn't get you. At... Um, as an Indian wedding, do does the groom make a speech or the father of the bride? Yeah. I can't hear you, DP. I I, I think I means my Hello? voice is yeah. Your voice is not audible to me. Okay, just give me one moment. Okay. Can you hear me, DP? Ah, yeah, it's okay now. It's okay now. Okay, thank you. Right. So we were saying um, at an Indian wedding, does the bride, um, not the bride, does the groom make a speech or the parent, the father of the bride make a speech? Here in India. Yes, in India. In India, actually, we have different culture. So it depends on uh, the culture, means if the Hindu marriage is going on, so especially the Brahmin who uh, does all the uh, means uh, puja and all. If it is the uh, means uh, marriage of a Muslim community, so okay. the yeah, so uh, uh, the people from the different culture uh, culture have the different uh, you can say uh, the custom. So accordingly, okay. it goes. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and uh, yeah, again, it's 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 a bit uh, slightly different in India because you you have a, arranged marriages as well. Exactly. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So um, let let me just talk about um, England, for example, because I think it's uh, again different culture. And uh, for, the, for those people who may not have been to England yet, uh, you might find things surprisingly different 
uh, although similar as well. So at a, at a wedding, generally we have speeches. We have a speech from the, the groom, and the groom is the man who's got married. And we have a speech from the bride's father. And what happens with the bride's father? So let's think about the values of marriage. Why, why do people get married? Well, um, hopefully there's some love involved. Hopefully there's a lot of uh, this desire to form a family, to create a great family, a legacy for their family and things like that. So uh, when we talk about um, marriage, generally we're talking about values of love, togetherness. Uh, it's wonderful. Now, I'm, uh, I'm 62 now. And I still go to, to weddings. My niece should have got married uh, this month. Unfortunately, that was postponed because of the virus. But uh, I can guarantee that uh, when, when her marriage takes place, they'll be, they'll, they'll be talking about the values of marriage, love, children, family, thinking about those, you know, the, the line of the family and, and the love of life and the love and warmth that marriage uh, can bring people. So this, this is what we mean by values. So think about your organization for a moment. So think about the, the culture of your organization. So if you work in a university, for example, what is the culture? Well, the culture is one of, of providing um, an opportunity for people to learn so that they can be educated, so that it, they can go out into the world and share their knowledge and make a better world that's that's a values driven speech so um every year universities they have uh, they have a big meeting where they have a new intake of uh, the undergraduates and they talk about the values of the university and their expectations uh, for the future their, the expectations for the new students and what's going to happen in those three or four years whilst that student is there so this is what we mean by values-driven speech. And of course, the, uh, when, when people graduate, there's the graduation speeches and the ceremonies and uh, you know, the senior people from the university, they talk about the values, the values of the organization, the values of these people going out into the world and they're gonna make some huge changes and make the world better for everybody. So is the speech, does the speech have any values? in there so this is interesting now again it, it, this values works at a team level it works at a department level and it works at a you know a company level as well and when we follow the values and the traditions of the company or the organization this is where we can really create something wonderful so aiming high having great values number nine now Number nine, are there any preferred stories or quotations? Now, I like quotations. Um, I haven't used any today, but I could do. I really like quotations. And what I like to do is think about the purpose of the speech. And then I've got some really great material, um, both at home, but these days on, you know, you, you can Google these things. Just so, for example, uh, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a great uh, philosopher, and if you've if you've ever studied any Nietzsche, there's uh, there's some very good ones. So you know the one that uh, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. So you might be talking about uh, resilience, for example. So this is a great quotation, and the idea of the quotation is that you take the words of somebody famous and you build your arguments either on or around uh, what has been said. So that strengthens your arguments. Now, stories as well. I really like stories, case studies, uh, even jokes, jokes that are pertinent to what you're saying. They can, they can act as stories as well. Metaphors are very strong. So just think through what, what stories, metaphors, quotations could you use that could, could strengthen the, uh, your speech. Then it talks about uh, rhetorical devices. What rhetorical devices could you use? Well, a quotation is a rhetorical device. When we're talking about rhetorical devices, we're talking about persuasion. How can you make your message 
stick because very interestingly, um, for example, I could just say to you, stay at home, stay safe. Now, when the coronavirus came along at the end of January, early February, uh, it, nobody knew a great deal about it. We knew that things were happening in, in Wuhan, in, in China, but we didn't know a great deal and we didn't know that it would have the impact that it's got now. So what, uh, what the politicians have been doing and what the scientists have been doing, they've been giving us lots of research data and statistics every day. Uh, there are stories, uh, you're probably familiar that uh, with our prime minister became very ill. He went, uh, he was in hospital for uh, about 10 days. He was in intensive care for three days. And uh, this is, this is uh, these are big stories. So it really brought home to the people of the UK uh, the difficulties that this horrible um, virus could give. If it can happen to politicians, top politicians, who you, you would think and hope that they, they had the common sense and the wherewithal to protect themselves, especially surrounded by all those scientists that they're working with, it just shows it could happen to anybody. So stories are great. Metaphors, contrasts. What happens if you do this? What happens... If you do that. Now, a tricolon there. A tricolon, uh, there are some very famous literary tricolons that I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with. So, I came, I saw, I conquered. That's a Julius Caesar. Friends, Romans, countrymen. Three uh, words beginning with T R I. It's a, it's like a triangle. It's, a, it's a three, and they have this rhythm. George Bush in 2003 said what Iraq needs now is peace, justice and security. Now I think what Iraq probably needed was a uh, hundred things at that particular time but just three is a really good number. Most people can remember three things. If I said to you okay I'm going to give you a list of 19 things in my presentation at the beginning there you'd have gone 19 oh gosh I can't remember that. But if I said to you, uh, I want you to, today, I want you to go home. I want you to think about preparation of your speech, the planning of your speech and the delivery of your speech. Now, most people can generally remember three things. Uh, so try and just try and get things down into threes where it's possible. Rhetorical questions. Uh, this is a really good one. So rhetorical questions are subjective in nature. So for example, uh, talking about politics, politics is a really interesting subject. And um, what we find is uh, wherever that, whoever you're talking to, they may have very different views to you. Uh, and even in, um, even in families, even in my classroom. So I can say to somebody, uh, what, are the, what are the questions that we ask our wives? What are the questions that we ask our daughters? Now, some people may have wives, some people may not. Uh, some people may have daughters, some people may not. So it's not, it's not a yes or no type of answer. What, so for example, what does coronavirus, if I asked 100 people, what is the impact of coronavirus on them? I could guarantee 100 completely different answers. Uh, these are not yes and no questions. They're open, they're subjective. And this is why we like rhetorical questions. We make them for effect, but they are of a subjective nature. Being empathetic um, is really important with our, our audience as well. Uh, whatever you, especially whatever you talk about. If, you, if you're talking about something emotional, if you talk, for example, I, I mean, the coronavirus is just, it's just a, a huge mass of great examples. So right from the, the outset, of these uh, ministerial dispatches every day or the prime ministerial uh, presentation. Uh, the first thing they say is, you know, they tell us how many people have died or are in hospital uh, since yesterday. And of course, every, every death is a member of a family. It has an impact on the individuals, has an impact on the community, has an impact on all of the people uh, working to save them. And, uh, and of course, people speak in a very empathetic and, and in a supportive and understanding way. Empathy is about meeting people 
uh, at their peg point. And this is really important because uh, if people don't feel that you empathize with them, if they don't feel that you're on the same wavelength as them, there will be a divide. There will be a, you know, it'll be an invisible, let's call it an invisible barrier, an invisible obstacle. Uh, you can't see it, but it's there. But if you have a, if people are struggling with something, as, so as, for example, as, as a, an educator, um, when, I'm, when I'm working with people, some people uh, in my IT career, for example, I was working with uh, very, very bright people, very, you know, great graduates, really enormous brains. And generally they get things very, very quickly. And if, when you get into that habit of where you say something and people act on it and you just think, well, everybody should do that, of course, but that's not the way it is. You, I, can, I could say the same things to other people and because maybe they're not switched on or they come from a different background or they don't have the technical uh, support that those people have had or whatever, they, they don't get things first time. But if I suggested to them, hey, come on, sharpen up, you're, you're really slow. What's the, what's the problem with you? Uh, that's not being very empathetic. I think one thing that uh, being a teacher has taught me is to be very respectful of people, always respect who they are, where they're from, all of their past achievements. Some people, as I say, get things first time, which is wonderful. Some people, it takes a little bit longer, but always, always, always encourage people to be the best that they can be and, and give them every support in their learning and, uh, and, and you know, sometimes people may have uh, difficulties at home. They may have difficulties with money. They may have difficulties with transport. They may have emotional or relationship problems. You don't know because they won't, they don't generally tell you. But for one reason or another, they're not, they're not keeping up. And all we can do as educators, I believe, is, is support them to the best of our ability and, uh, and give them all the encouragement uh, that we can do. And this is a, the next point there, the last point on number 10, repetition. Uh, this is a, 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 in the garden. Uh, we have a big communal garden at the back of our house and uh, there's, there's lots of children who live in the house now. And one of the children is about 15 months old now, little boy, Sydney. And I just watch Sydney when he's in the garden and he just follows what he, his older brother does. His brother's about four and he just repeats, repeats, repeats. They just keep repeating things till they master them. And it's amazing. Now, as, as we get older, we tend to think, oh, yes, I should, uh, you know, I'm a reasonably clever person. I'll get that. I'll get that. I think repetition, if you're, especially when you're, you're learning a skill, uh, doing things repeatedly and getting really good, strong outcomes, that is definitely a good way of doing it. So one thing I would say around making speeches is to, if you've, if you've got to make a speech and you've got to go through this all, all this planning, preparation and practice, it might be very useful to you to make that speech maybe two or three times. And I can guarantee that as you make those speeches multiple times, it will improve. And the more you think about it, the more you'll start looking for opportunities to strengthen uh, either the structure or the content or both. And that's a really useful thing. So to be able to go through that process of repetition, because if you want mastery in anything, you know, riding a bike, for example, um, it's not easy at first. If you've never ridden a bike, you've never ridden a two wheel bike uh, and you keep falling off, there's only one way you're going to do that. And that is to keep practicing. And it's the same with driving a car. Uh, you don't you don't learn to pass your trust your driving test on the first day. It's something that we've got to go through multiple times. Uh, think of every little mistake that you make as a learning opportunity. See if you can strengthen that next time. So I think that's uh, really really useful. Now I'm just going to have a sip of water. How are we doing, DP? I'm good, sir. Uh, it has Is everybody been really... still with us? Tell, just tell me they're still with us. That's good, because I can't see them. I'd love to see everybody. That would be nice. Yeah, it's it's going on uh, really well. I uh, mean, uh, we all... Um, uh, uh, it's really uh, wonderful to listen to you all the time. And today okay. also you're talking really wonderful, sir. 
and uh, so many things we have covered so far and uh, with your permission yes sir please sir continue okay so uh, unfortunately we had a little little hiccup with uh, with the file now so i'm going i'm going to ask you to visualize uh, i mentioned three things three three is the magic number in public speaking so i just like to talk to everybody about speech structure. So coming back to where we started, I want you to imagine that on June the 15th, you've got to make a 15 minute speech and you're gonna make three points. So point A, point B and point C. Why three points? Well, most people can remember three things simultaneously. It's, it's just a fact. So three is a really good number. And if you're really, really clever, and I'm sure you guys are as well, you can actually break those three points down into three sub points each. So effectively you can speak about nine things, but as long as you group them together in threes, people can follow them very easily. So two of the most important elements of a speech are the introduction, the introduction and the conclusion. So why do we have an introduction? Well, people need to know what the speech is about. And if you tell them at the outset, I'm gonna to talk to you today about X, Y, and Z. I'm gonna to talk to you about planning, uh, practice, and preparation, okay? So there are my three things. You tell people up front what you're gonna talk about, everybody knows what to expect. And that's a great help. We actually call it signposting, uh, which again is a lovely metaphor. And why do we have signposts on the road? roads because we like to tell people where we're going you know because uh, you'll get to a junction and uh, you can go this way you can go that way you can go that way and the signpost will give you an indication of the right place oh you found it oh dp you've got it there you go excellent so that's good so by telling people what to expect and where you're going you're helping them so that as you move through your speech, everybody can follow X, Y, and Z. Uh, something very, very important. If you tell people you're gonna talk about X, Y, and Z, just make sure that you relate to X, Y, and Z in the order you specify, because if you don't, for some extraordinary reason, people go a little bit crazy. So if you're talking about X, Y, and Z, and you announce them in that order, just run through them, in that order. If you don't run through them in the order you specify, people come up with all sorts of strange uh, theories as to why you didn't go in the order you specify. So just help people and go in the order that you specify. And finally, we need a conclusion. So what we do in the conclusion there, we go over the major points. So just take out the huge points of X, Y, and Z just reiterate them, go through them one more time. And generally we want to end on a high. So uh, probably at the end of uh, today's session, when we've done the Q and A, um, I'll say to you something like, okay, I hope you found this very useful today. Um, I want you to go away. I want you to think about these things. I want you to think that you've got this speech on the 15th of June. And what are the three points that you're gonna go away and make? And I want you to go away and really you know, do some research on those three points. You've only got 15 minutes. 15 minutes for a novice speaker seems like an eternity, but I can assure you 15 minutes goes very, very quickly. So just really think about uh, those things. So the conclusion, we want to end on a high. So I'm going to come back to you. I'd love to speak to you next week. If DP invites me back, I'd like to speak to you about so many different things in and around public speaking and uh, next sir week, it will be so pleasure to invite you and have you again uh, on the Arts virtual meeting really oh yeah I'm, I'm making work we all will be happy to have again yeah i'm making a great deal of work for myself here but so uh, that's okay if uh, that's that's what we call inviting yourself back to the party but um that's that's very nice of you to uh, to invite me and uh, i'm sure i'm sure if everybody feels the same we i'd, I'd love to uh, come back because there's just so many things i'd love to talk to you all about. So coming back to the introduction and the conclusion there, um, it's called primacy and recency. So the most important two elements of your speech are the beginning and the end. People will remember if you start well, 
people will remember the introduction and that will give them uh, the incentive to want to continue listening to you. And the conclusion, we want to end on a high. We want to always make people feel uplifted, that they've learned something valuable, so that they've got something they can take away and to work on. And always encourage people, as we said, to be their best and always believe in them. And that so long as they're on that path towards that uh, personal improvement, always believe in them and what they can achieve. And uh, I think I think that's generally, in terms of speech structure, what makes a good speech. We always want to end on a high, make people feel, yeah, I can do this. I can do this if I practice more, if I work on this, if I, I'm going to get some really good consistent results in what, whatever discipline that we're talking about. It really uh, doesn't matter. Okay, DP, it's 22-4. Uh, has anybody got any questions that they uh, Yes, yeah, like sir. To... I got two questions. With your kind permission, uh, may I ask uh, one by one? Of course. Uh, yeah, first question, uh, sir, actually, uh, this is regarding the hesitation. Most of the people, they have hesitation in their mind when they speak or uh, they find the thought connectivity. And because of that, uh, they... I find difficult to make the speech very constructive. So how do you suggest to overcome this hesitation and uh, thought connectivity when they speak in the public? Okay, I think I think I touched upon this earlier on in uh, in this presentation and and that that comes down. It really is the, I think the core of a good speech comes from its planning, because if you're not prepared, if you've not got all the, the things that you need. Now, as I said, let, let's just use this 15th of June, 15 minute speech. Now, the, the tricky thing is in a 15 minute speech, it's not, it's not what you put into the speech, it's the amount of material you leave out. There is so much, there's so much I would love to talk to you about today, if only there were time in, in a, a one hour presentation. So I think what we really need to do is just think about what what are the most important and urgent things things that we could talk about in those 15 minutes and the more you think through those those elements and again we're asking you to come up with three things three major things now the more you research these themes the more will emerge and the more familiar that you will become with the material that you want to share with people but at the end of the day you've got to really work out what are the messages that you want people to leave the building with or to the presentation with rather. What are the, what are the, the, the lasting messages or impacts that you want people to go away with? And I find that the more I think, think through those things and the more I talk about them, the easier I find it and there's less hesitation. Now, again, when I, when I was a young man, I found public speaking incredibly difficult. I, it's not something that I enjoyed, but uh, because of my work in IT, I just found myself having, you know, as I was working up through uh, the IT departments, I'd find myself in change management meetings. I'd find myself having to uh, chair meetings, lead meetings, contribute at meetings. And what I would do for those meetings, I would spend as much time in my preparation for attending the meeting where I knew that I would be speaking as I would for a presentation. And what happens, I find, is that the more you know your material, the better you know your material, the easier it is to find it. So certainly when I was a young man, I was very, very tied to my notes. I would, I would write everything and then I'd try and read it out. And you know what? It, it just didn't work. But I've got uh, I've got this method now where I just study, 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 and generally I will write down three major points that I want people to consider straight after the speech or in an ongoing way. And that that means that uh, so for example today um, I've not really been hesitating about any of the things that I'm talking about. It's just that as I said, the more familiar you become with the material, the easier you find it, and there's just less hesitation. Now, one of my students, well, this question has arisen a few times uh, over the years, and uh, 
you know, people ask me this question, what's going through your mind when you're speaking? Uh, to which my answer is generally nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I know there are things going that I can hear people outside. There are things happening outside here. Um, there are things happening outside the room. There are things that are happening in the world, good things, bad things. Uh, but when I'm speaking, when I'm in class with people, and you've seen me in class, DP, I just switch everything off and I'm just totally focused in the moment, uh, which is a lovely, mindful way of enjoying your work and enjoying this opportunity, this connection that you have with people, this desire to want to share the, you know, the best of, of what you have to give them. And I can do it these days without hesitation. But what I would say, it's a bit like riding the bicycle. Uh, if you can ride your bicycle now without hesitation, there's a reason for that. And that's because you practice it. But you only, only ever, ever practice what works. If you practice things that don't work, you just get better at getting worse. So that, that would be my answer. Just keep working hard at your material. Really prioritize it. If you've got 15 minutes, what three, what three key messages could you give? And you'll be able to consolidate that message that much easier. So that, that would be my answer to the hesitation question. Really getting to know your material inside out. And thank you very much, sir, for your elaborative answer on the uh, question number one. I got one, uh, another question from Mr. Prakash. Actually, he is focusing and he wants to know that the difference between, uh, in your opinion, the presentation and a speech. A presentation and a speech. Okay. Uh, very interestingly, uh, I don't like make I don't like making speeches. <laughs> That sounds terrible from somebody who teaches speech writing. Um, I don't like making speeches. Uh, I am a classroom trainer. I love being in class, generally with 10 to 12 people, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more sometimes. But just being in class, nearly everything I do is in the form of a presentation. That generally means that, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable with... Uh, with whiteboards and flip charts, uh, probably because we didn't have whiteboards and flip charts. Well, we had flip charts and whiteboards, but we didn't have PowerPoint 40 years ago and, uh, and all of this nice technical stuff that we've got now. So I'm a, I'll, let's call me an old fashioned classroom trainer. So if, if we had chalk and blackboards, I'd probably still use that as well. So just me, the student and the subject matter. That for me, is heaven. Uh, generally, with speeches, you need to be very, very focused on, on time. And generally, as I've said, try and keep it to three major subjects. And generally, because of time constraints, there isn't a great deal of time for, for too much repetition. So I think that's one of the constraints about making speeches. One of the lovely things about making presentations and having uh, you know your classroom and your students there in front of you, they can ask you questions. You can go over various nuances that may or may not have arisen in class. And, and that's a lovely thing. I think presentations are much more interactive, just like this one is developing now with the Q&A session. Generally in speeches, uh, there's not that, uh, there's not always that opportunity for Q&As depending on, on the time and how things have been organized. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It has been really nice listening to you. Uh, another question, sir, if you allow, uh, yes. can I ask? Of course. Ah, yeah, sir. Sir, actually, how do you suggest uh, to improve the fluency or uh, means uh, in your opinion? Most of the people, they struggle when they speak in public and they find difficult to connect the thoughts from one sentence to another sentence. So how do you suggest to improve the fluency? Okay, I think, well, coming back to what I was saying earlier, there's only one way you, you can improve anything and that is by understanding the process and improving the process. Now, 
as I said uh, earlier, when, when I was a young man, I really did not enjoy public speaking. Uh, it made me feel very uncomfortable. It made me feel very insecure. I was talking to, you know, senior leaders uh, when I was 18, 19. And, uh, you know, when you're talking to sort of very experienced people who've been through the, you know, the corporate world, and they have all this knowledge and experience and you're 18 or 19 and you're, you're trying to influence them in one way or another, you, you probably feel like you get this, what we call imposter syndrome, that uh, you're trying to influence these people, but you've only got this very fraction of a experience that they have. But uh, looking back, that was a very good thing. And I was often tongue-tied. Generally, I couldn't connect my thoughts and I found it very very difficult but uh, the, I was very lucky in many ways that uh, these these guys uh, these men and women were incredibly patient with me I think they saw that uh, I was working hard and I was giving it hundred percent and I think when you see anybody giving it hundred percent it's, it's very difficult to to be harsh on them so I think everybody knows that if you want to be good at any anything that's a skill you know whether you want to be a good cook or you know, a surgeon, for example, just 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 think about being a surgeon and uh, one day somebody's going to give you a very sharp knife and you're going to have to open up a human body. Now, interestingly, I, I work with a lot of doctors and surgeons or have worked with doctors and surgeons over the years. And I ask them, how do you feel when you when you have to make that incision? And they say, gosh, incredibly nervous because they've done all that. They know the, the theory. They've done the theory and they've they've worked with, uh, you know, uh, sort of plastic models but they've never done it on a real human being and there's only one way to get experience and that is to practice and to do it and to learn and and as I say you you're going to make mistakes and uh, but you know when you've got a scalpel in your hand you don't want to make too many mistakes so really think about practicing connecting those dots the more you do things the easier it becomes um if you, if you want to know what makes me anxious, uh, I'm going to tell you something really funny. Uh, it's generally when my wife asks me to do some DIY at home. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather speak to uh, a thousand people, 10,000 people than do any uh, do it yourself um, or make, make any changes at home because it's, I'm really not very good. I've got all the tools. I just don't use them very well. Uh, as a speaker, as a speech writer, uh, you've got some fantastic tools. You just need to use them more and more often. The more familiar you become with those tools, the easier it becomes. You, ju you just get this sense of knowledge that you're doing the right thing at the right time, and that's going to lead to more consistent outcomes. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Thank you uh, for your uh, elaborative answer. Uh, some of the uh, questions uh, is still there, but they are all uh, relevant for which you have already answered. Uh, that is one question is from Mr. Viren Kumar Pandey. He says that he speaks very fluently whenever he is in the class, but sometimes when he goes out for gathering uh, of teachers, he hesitate to speak how to remove that. So what exercises he should do? Oh my gosh. All right. So there, there are there are lots of vocal exercises. So perhaps if we do if we do another session, and I hope we do another session maybe next week, um, we can do some vocal exercises. Because what vocal exercises do is uh, a bit like if if anybody I don't know if anybody plays the piano or the violin or the uh, the flute, uh, you just practice the scales. Yeah. So you go through. The things that will help you build the building blocks of what it is you want to achieve so when you're playing music uh, you're playing notes so, but you need to know what the notes are and you need to know you know when you read music uh, you need to understand uh, the notes and what order they're played in and the timing and uh, and how hard or how soft you touch the keys because that's all all defined in musical notation and what we've got, uh, and again, I can uh, we can do some vocal development exercises where you can improve your fluency, and in doing so, improve your confidence. 
But uh, coming back to the question, uh, it's again, this is really interesting. Um, I love being in the classroom. I love doing my presentations. I love uh, anything to do with public speaking and communication and self-improvement. Um, but if I go to a meeting, I feel awkward speaking up. Now, when I'm when I'm in my classroom, because I know the I know the uh, the context. I know the context of why the audience are there. They're they're there for a particular reason. Uh, when I if I go to a meeting or a networking event and somebody asks me to speak, I don't know the audience and I don't know what their expectations are. And sometimes uh, you can come across, you know, if I, if I kind of introduced myself the way you introduced me earlier, uh, which was lovely, by the way, um, some people may be offended uh, by that. So I think it's about knowing your where you're comfortable, knowing your audience, the type of people that you're working with and their expectations. So I think I think that generally answers the question. So I don't like making speeches to people who are not my audience because a lot of them won't be interested in what I have to say. Uh, not because uh, what I've got to say isn't interesting. It's just that maybe it's not their priority or they've heard it before or whatever. It really doesn't matter. But I know that people who come on my classes, they're there for a reason. They're there to learn. And it's my job to share the best of what I have to share with them and, uh, and generally it goes very nicely and uh, it's, like I say it's the most rewarding uh, career it's the best yeah it's the best job I've ever had being an instructor and um, if anybody if you're feeling that you're not very fluent at the moment in your speaking through practicing the right things through building your confidence and by getting yourself in front of nice ordinary everyday educated people who will be willing to listen to you I think that's the, the most wonderful uh, thing to be able to share your knowledge and your experience uh, with people and, uh, and, and that you have that opportunity to, to share the best of your, your material. Thank you very much, sir, for your elaborative answers. And uh, you have attended uh, many queries, many questions from the audience. Uh, sir, I think there are many questions and uh, we will check up those questions later when uh, means with your kind permission, if you agree, we will have you again in the next session. And uh, sir, it has really been nice uh, listening to you. And not today, on all the occasion, I found it very interesting. So thank you very much, sir, for your concern and joining us today and uh, giving a very elaborative lecture on how to uh, remove the fear of public speaking. And uh, sure, sir, with your kind permission, we again uh, will invite you to uh, deliver some more, uh, I mean, content related to public speaking. Uh, may I now request Dr. Siram Pandey to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, over to Dr. Uh, Pandey. Thank you, uh, DP. Um, at the outset, I thank our seasoned resource person, Mr. Vince Stevenson, for his insightful, insightful talk on fear of public speaking. I even personally, I have been fortunate sir, to attend your session during my Commonwealth Fellowship at University of London. Your sessions, whole day session, helped me a lot to improve my public speaking. So I am pers at personal level, I am very thankful to you. Uh, we are really uh, enlightened with your knowledge and presence, sir. Your, your ideas and experience about the public speaking definitely helps our audience and participants to, to improve their public speaking as well as to, to, uh, to, uh, to remove the fear of public speaking. As we got lots of questions from the uh, participants that how we can uh, improve uh, the public speaking skills and these uh, ideas will definitely uh, help uh, them to improve their public speaking. So our heart, heartfelt thanks to all the participants for attending the virtual meeting at the YouTube live and we are very thankful 
to them to join us um, uh, for virtual meeting and uh, with all these warm words and the kind message we move to the end of today's virtual meeting once again i am thankful for all for joining this session and a special thanks to our resource person win system sir thank you sir thank you for joining us thank you so much that's, that's very kind of you um for for those those lovely words so i really appreciate that so uh, maybe next time if there is a next time we can talk about fluency overcoming the hesitation through practice and i've got a whole bunch of um exercises that we can have a, a great deal of fun with online things that you can practice at home uh, one day of course i would love to meet you all if you ever find yourself in london come along and say hello definitely sir definitely and, uh, yeah. and we have a great deal of fun in the classroom it's a great it's a great shame i can't see you all uh, i'm sure. talking to a screen sure. here so uh, it's highly unusual for me so uh, can i wish you all thank well first of all thank you all for being on the call thank you for listening to me and uh, you know stay safe look after yourselves look after your family and have a great evening thank you very much sir wish you the thank same you. stay safe stay healthy thank, thank you. you sir see you next time ciao okay sir thank, thank you. you very much bye